Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Ben Levine, who's going to talk today about Meltdown, Foreshadow, and Spectre. So Ben, there's been a lot of attention on hardware-specific attacks. Typically in the past, most of the attacks happened on software. This is sort of a brand new threat level, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the ones that came up most recently were last year. There was a lot of announcements and publicity around Meltdown and Spectre and Foreshadow, which were attacks on the fundamental underlying hardware in the CPU. And I think that was a real eye-opener for a lot of people who sort of assumed that that fundamental hardware was secure. So these vulnerabilities were discovered by, I think, Google Project Zero. How much damage can they do? They can do a lot of damage. Um, basically, what we're talking about are vulnerabilities that enable data that should be secure to be accessed by code that should not be able to access that data. So if you think about what that would mean in a cloud server, for example, you have one instance of an application that's running on behalf of one user. These sorts of attacks would enable that code to access data that belongs to a different user and that shouldn't be visible uh, or accessible by that first user's program. So basically, anything, credit card information, passwords, other security credentials could be harvested by malicious code that shouldn't be able to access that. Let's drill down into this. Sure. Okay. So why did these, these vulnerabilities actually show up? They, they showed up because there are lots of really clever engineers out there trying to make CPUs really fast. Um, and that is a good thing, and it's led to a lot of advances, but unfortunately there are some negative side effects. So you know, sketching out very roughly, if you look at CPU performance over the years, it's risen really fast. Um, in fact, until about 2005, imager CPU performance was improving at over 50% a year, and that was because of CPU architects um, using a lot of really clever techniques to get as much performance as possible out of the transistors that they had to work with. And this just shows the fact that the number of transistors they had to work with, you know, given Moore's law, was going up exponentially. So they had a lot of things that they could do, and they were using those to give a lot of performance improvements. Around 2005, roughly, give or take a few years, this curve started to level off and went to about 20% per year. And that's because most of the low-hanging fruit had already been uh, used up. So the techniques that were needed to get more performance became more and more complex. That was, some, that was what, somewhere in the range of 65, 40 nanometers? Yeah, about in that range. And, and the you know, leveling off was due to some of the process characteristics, but also just, again, to this idea of sort of microarchitectural exhaustion, where all of the, the easy things had been done already. Um, so what, what that meant was to, to even get this 20% improvement, CPU architects had to rely on even more complex techniques and layer multiple techniques on top of each other. There are some techniques that are used in modern CPUs that actually were used in mainframes because they're just sort of fundamental pieces. But you can imagine this sort of, it's almost like a, an archeological dig where you have multiple layers built on top of each other. And all of those make CPUs the, the sort of large complex beasts that they are today. And the problem with that is complexity is arguably one of the number one enemies of security. And so people were building in ways of speeding up and, and lowering the power because you couldn't get that from just scaling, so now we had to add in new things such as what branch prediction, uh, speculative execution, which are basically the equivalent of what, prefetch on a uh, search engine? In a way, you can think of that. And, and in fact, it's interesting you mentioned speculative execution because that was one of the fundamental pieces that led to, to Meltdown and Spectre. Uh, th that's not a new technique, but the implementation of it was something that had gotten more complex over the years. So just briefly, the way Meltdown worked is it used speculative execution to access data that shouldn't be accessed in a way that should be safe because that access data wouldn't actually be able to be read by the program that called for it. The problem was that data was pulled into cache and there were ways to then extract that data from the cache without reading it directly. Reading it directly was disallowed, 
but the indirect accesses were not anticipated and were not protected against. So rather than saying that, well, branch prediction was insecure because it wasn't her saying that the cache was insecure, it was really the interaction between these two complex pieces that led to the security vulnerability. And security has to be thought of as an ongoing, you have to plug holes as you go, right? Because it, people are always going to come up with better and better methods of getting in. That's, that's certainly true. Um, and in software-based security, it's, you have the advantage that you can actually patch and update your software. And where a new vulnerability uh, is found, you can come up with a, a hot fix to protect against it. The problem comes when we're talking about hardware. So, you know, the, the major CPU vendors, if there's a fundamental vulnerability found, they can't patch their hardware. There may be software workarounds that provide some level of protection, usually at the cost of performance, but they can't fix the underlying hardware. So you really need to use an approach to hardware design that gives you just more inherent protection against vulnerabilities. And Meltdown, Spectre, and Foreshadow aren't the only uh, attacks on hardware, right? There are others. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Since those were announced, there, there have been many others like Branch Scope and Lazy FPU. Uh, there's others being found all the time, and there will be many more, I'm, I'm certain, found in the future. And again, that's because of this problem of complexity. When you have a very large, complex system, you have, you know, on the order of, of N squared interactions to protect and make sure are secure, and the attacker only needs to find one. So the odds are really stacked against the, the chip designer, the CPU designer, they have a, an increasingly uh, exponentially harder time as complexity grows. So the old method of using clever techniques to improve performance, uh, lower power, are they slowing down? Are we now saying, okay, we really have to architect from the beginning, we have to potentially really understand how data moves and where it can be blocked? Yeah, I mean, those techniques are still important. We still have compute workloads that are getting uh, more processor intensive. We're still having you know, devices that need to be more and more power conscious. So absolutely, architects still need to be thinking about higher performance and thinking about lower power and trying to come up with clever techniques. Um, but they also need to be thinking about security uh, in a deeper way. And we need to think about security from not just the microarchitectural level of how do we build the CPU, um, but the architectural level of the system itself. How do we divide processing? How do we divide uh, functionality in the whole system so that we're doing things that need to be secure in a domain that's inherently secure and doing things that we care about the performance in a domain where maybe security isn't as important. So it becomes more of a system architecture problem than a microarchitecture problem because solving the microarchitectural problem is really, really hard. And one of the issues that people are dealing with right now is how to partition data processing, and it's going across lots of different elements. So you have a lot of things in motion at any time, and they may vary from one to the next. How do we solve that? Yeah, security can't be thought of just a, a static process where you set a, a rigid security boundary um, and then you say, well, everything's fine, I'll just keep everything within that boundary. That's not possible. And what needs to be protected changes as workloads change and the threats that need to be protected against also change as attackers come up with new methods to breach systems and, and access data. So whatever your security solution is, it needs to be something that's adaptable and programmable and can be smart enough to detect when something anomalous is going on in the system. As we push forward on Moore's Law, as we push down to five nanometers, three nanometers, and maybe even one and a half nanometers, the oxides become thinner, the distance between the uh, different transistors and different elements on a, a chip become uh, much tighter. How, do, how does that affect security? Yeah, there, there's you know, different types of attacks that, that matters more and less to you. So if you're talking about something like an invasive attack where you're actually going to take a physical chip and you're going to grind off the top layer and you're going to try and image it um, layer by layer to understand how it works, and then maybe you want to do some uh, fibbing attacks where you drop some wires down 
or you make changes to the circuitry, those types of attacks do get more and more difficult as you go to smaller and smaller geometries, just because of the physics of the problem. If you're dealing with a structure that's you know, only a, a few atoms wide, trying to make physical changes to that becomes extremely difficult. But if you're thinking about this sort of logical security, in some sense, if you think about the functionality of an SOC or a CPU, it doesn't really matter what the physical transistors are that implement that functionality. The same sort of logical um, vulnerabilities and, and the same sort of security concerns exist. You may have the problem as you go to smaller geometries, you can have more and more transistors, which gets back to the point I was making earlier about complexity. So you potentially, if you look at things like AI accelerator chips that are being built in advanced process nodes that have you know many, many thousands of processing elements, we now have a very complex chip with lots of possible interactions that may lead to vulnerabilities. So to the extent that smaller geometries enable more complex chips, there are sort of some inherent problems. But if you look at the same design implemented in, you know, um, 22 nanometer versus seven nanometer, uh, from a logical perspective, there's not that much diff difference in terms of the vulnerabilities and things you need to protect against. How about as we get into advanced packaging where you have potentially multiple chips developed at different uh, geometries and sometimes old, sometimes new? Yeah, there's a couple of aspects, some positive, some negative about that. Um, one is, again, the sort of physical uh, attacks, which are really used in practice. There are companies who, you know, the specific business is to take chips, uh, reverse engineer them, and either develop compatible chips or sell that information. So these physical attacks are real. Multi-chip packages and advanced packages make that process more difficult. Um, and having multiple geometries to deal with at the same time makes imaging more difficult. Uh, stack die makes fibbing more difficult. So those sorts of advanced packaging techniques can, can make attackers' lives a little more difficult. But, and I hate to keep saying the same thing over again, as you're talking about multiple die um, and multiple chiplets in a package, you're now talking about more components, more complexity, more interactions, and now you may be talking about silicon that comes from different manufacturers with different ideas about security and different architectures that may interact in unexpected ways that open vulnerabilities. Ben Levine, thanks for a great explanation. You're very welcome. Thank you, Ed.